the story began with curiosity and passion for a ball and turned into a story of a great talent stuck in a limited body striving to prove himself and his abilities. It's a story of mental and physical development together. A story of a young man who wants to please his countrymen after leaving them to achieve his dreams. This is the story of the beginning of Messi's career and how he ascended to the top of football. In the province of Santa Fe, particularly in the city of Rosario, Lionel Messi started his footballing career at a very young age. He always played with his older brothers Rodrigo and Mateus, and at five years of age, he played with the local Grandoli youth team. And despite his age, you can already see his change of pace and great dribbling skills. And usually coaches at that level would emphasize passing the ball, but nobody told that to Messi. Lionel played almost two years at Grandoli, and they won all their matches. And in every training session, Lionel was disciplined and reserved. Gonzalo Diaz, a teammate of Lionel at Grandoli, said that there were many talented players that played at the club, but they lacked the perseverance in training. His father Jorge had a say in this. His philosophy was simple. Work hard, be persistent and show humility, and you can achieve your goals. Jorge was also devouring his sons daily with VHS tapes of Maradona and was Leo's second coach in Grandoli as well. The writer Guillaume Balaguer said in his biography about Messi that his father was his number one idol. He was his mentor, hero, and he had absolute trust in him. Jorge was also the person who decided to transfer Leo to one of Argentina's big clubs, Noel's old boys. Lionel was a key part of what was later called the machine of 87, an unbeatable youth side. One of the players' fathers mentioned that Messi scored approximately 100 goals per season, which also meant that Leo had scored almost 500 goals with the team between 1994 to 2000. But there was an issue. At the age of 10, Lionel's parents decided to consult a specialist after the advice of one of Newell's directors. They noticed that Lionel was smaller than the other kids, as he was about 10 centimeters shorter than the average kid at his age group. They went to Dr. Diego Schwornstein in January of 1997, and the diagnosis took about six months to determine Leo's problem, partial growth hormone deficit. So Lionel had to inject himself every day with the biosynthetic growth hormone starting from January of 98. And it was not cheap. It costed the Messi family between $1,000 to $1,500 a month. Fortunately for his father Jorge, he worked for a state-owned steel company. So insurance covered the treatment's cost for the first two years. But Argentina's economy was collapsing in the late 1990s. And after the insurance stopped covering the treatment, Jorge was struggling to make ends meet. He went to old boys for support, as the club president Sergio Almiron sent funds to Jorge on a monthly basis, but the amounts varied. Jorge was asking for more, but there was no response from the club. He tried pressuring the club by taking Lionel for a trial at River Plate. Noels tried to solve the problem immediately, but in the end, they just couldn't bear the full cost of the treatment. Everything was pushing Jorge toward making a very difficult decision. At that time, numerous Argentinian families were fleeing the country for a better life after the economic disaster. Young footballers within big Argentinian clubs were considered assets and ways to liquidate. And for Jorge and his son Lionel, it was well worth the risk. After the trial with River, an agent called Horacio Gagioli was informed of Messi's talents. He had a relationship with the prestigious Catalan agent Josep Manguela, 
who was very close to Barcelona and was responsible for Maradona's transfer to the Blaugrana in 1982. Horacio asked for tapes of Lionel from Jorge and sent them to Mengele's office. Then Mengele talked to his friend and then Barca sporting director Carlos Rikshak and insisted on setting up a trial for Lionel. Jorge and his son Lionel flew to Barcelona in 2000 for the trials and in each session Lionel gave it his all and was impressive but there was no decision from the club. When Rikshak came back from the Olympics he had the chance to see Messi at the end of his trial. He was convinced and thought that Barcelona had to sign the youngster immediately. But there were some doubts inside the club. No one wanted to bear the responsibility of a family that risked everything and left their home for this opportunity. And success was not guaranteed and there were no guarantees that all the costs behind signing Lionel would be repaid on the field. So Jorge and his son Leo went back to Argentina in the beginning of October after missing way too many school days. Many factors resulted in Barcelona stalling the signing of Messi. First, Lionel was a small foreign boy who was only 13 years old, and La Masia directors at that time preferred local players who were around 15 or even 16 years of age. Second, Barcelona had to find his father some work in accordance with FIFA regulations which banned any signing of foreign players under 18 unless he was accompanied by a parent. Jorge also asked to live with his son in an apartment outside of La Masia's campus. Third, Barcelona was struggling with several first team issues after their superstar Figo had left. So signing a 13 year old foreigner was not one of their priorities, especially with all the costs attached to Messi from hormone treatment to private accommodation. After two months had passed without a response from Barcelona and with Jorge getting more frustrated by the minute, Rexach came up with a solution to calm things down. With the presence of Mengele and Horacio with Rexach at the Pompeia Tennis Club, Carlos signed a napkin and he wrote on that napkin that he was committed to the signing of Messi as per the previously agreed figures and regardless of opinions on the contrary. That last phrase is crucial as it points to some board members who were against the idea of signing Lionel and all the various costs attached to the youngster. It was an important step before signing the first official contract and in January of 2001, all parties agreed on the signing after President Juan Gaspar gave his final nod on all of Jorge and Messi's requests, including the hormone treatment. Jorge and Lionel took their first big step towards achieving their goals, but there were still some difficulties. Lionel broke his left fibula in only his second match and when he came back two months later, he had an ankle injury straight away. And Leo's mother had to go back to Argentina as living in Catalonia was proving to be difficult for his brothers and his little sister. It was a tough period for Lionel that made him rethink his future. Either he goes back with his family to Argentina or split his family and stay with his father in Barcelona. But he insisted on staying and was determined to achieve his dream. Finally, the focus was back to football. In football and mental terms, Lionel was evolving very quickly in Barcelona's various age groups. And in physical terms, Lionel was significantly growing in front of the coach's eyes as he grew 29 centimeters in a few months. He had a fantastic attitude towards training and had only football to look forward to as he was alone with his father away from his friends and family in a foreign city and in a foreign land. It was a tough situation, but that kept him focused only on playing football. In the 2001-2002 season, Lionel played in the famous Junior B team alongside names such as Fabrigas and Gerard Piquet. That season also saw the young manager Tito Villanova taking over the team. In the following season and under the coach Alex Garcia, Lionel started to truly shine as he played in every match and was the top goalscorer of the team. Garcia used to experiment with Messi in many different positions within the lineup but Leo preferred to play centrally behind the striker and not stuck on the wings. That team won every single title at hand and despite the weak scouting system in 2003 compared to today, that cadet A side attracts some eyes. One of them was Arsenal's representative in Spain, Francis Cagigao, who was astonished by Messi's talents and connected with his father Jorge. Arsenal were the first European club to send Leo an offer since he arrived in Barcelona. But too many obstacles made the signing difficult. But despite that, Arsenal succeeded in signing Fabrigas. As the youth side thrived in Barcelona, the first team was in dire crisis. The return of Van Gaal was considered a failure. 
and the new signings flopped as the Blaugrana ended the season with their worst league position in 15 years. Barca president Juan Gaspar resigned and fresh faces entered the fray. It was a new era for Barcelona. And this new board and management were aware of the many talents within the club. As Lionel Messi signed a new contract until 2012 with a buyout clause of 30 million euros, which increases to 80 million euros if he got into the Barca B squad and 150 million euros if he managed to get into the first team. In the 2003 2004 season, Messi played in 37 matches. What's fascinating about that season was his meteoric rise between the ranks. He started that season with the under 19 B side in August then played some matches for the A-side of the same age group. And that caught the attention of first-team manager Frank Reichardt, who was in need of youth players to fill the squad for a mid-season friendly against Porto for the opening of their new Dragao Stadium in November. Most of the first-team players left for international duty, as Messi debuted with the first team in the 75th minute at the age of 16 years and 145 days wearing the number 14 shirt. When he came back from that friendly, he immediately played with the Barca C side for the first time. 11 matches were enough to promote him once again to play for the Barca B side. In the final stretch of that season, Messi was alternating between all of these age groups, excluding the first team. Whenever any age group in Barcelona was struggling that season, they would ask Messi for support and to help them win either by playing with players of his age or with players four years older than him, as was the case in the Barca B side which played in the third division of the Spanish league. His father Jorge recalls, suddenly we went from nothing to everything we had dreamed of. When Messi stopped his hormone treatment at 14 years of age, Barca staff made him a special training regime to focus on his physical strength and speed by increasing his lower body muscle mass. And the change was clear. But despite debuting with the first team at 16 years of age, Lionel had to wait a while before returning to Reichardt's side again. That first team was restructuring under new stars like Deco, Ito, Ronaldinho and Xavi. That's why in the 2004-2005 season, Leo was a permanent starter for the Barca B side. Reichardt was aware of Messi and talked to his father about his extraordinary attributes, but he wanted them to have some patience as he waited for the right time to use him. Leo started taking part in first-team training sessions, as Barca left-back Giovanni Van Bronckhorst said that Ronaldinho mentioned in Messi's first training session that he's going to be better than him. But the reality was that Messi was not ready. He played for Barca B, who played in the third division. On top of that, he played in a 3-4-3 system as almost a second striker. And despite the insistence of the coaches on Leo staying on the wings, the Argentine loved to dribble inside with the ball towards the central areas. The specific role doesn't have a place within the 4-3-3 system that the first team used. It was also very rare in those days for a 16-year-old or 17-year-old to feature with the first team in official matches. But as days had passed and with each training session with the first team, the doubts started to disappear. And almost a year after his debut against Porto, Reichardt subbed in Messi in the 82nd minute in a tough match against neighbors Espanyol. It was not a change to appease the fans and win them over. The Argentine was asked to impact the match. At 17 years and 4 months, Messi became the youngest Barca player at that time to play in an official match. Messi continued the season alternating between the first and second team. Despite being on the bench most of the time, he gained a lot of experience just by being around professional players, either inside or outside the pitch. Ronaldinho was one of the players that had a big impact on Messi as he gained his trust quickly and became like a big brother to him, along with Deco, Silvino and Motta. With Barcelona closing in on a league title, Messi got another chance as he came on as a substitute in the 88th minute against Albacete. With two minutes left, Ronaldinho found him on two occasions. The first was called offside, which seemed incorrect. On the second try, Messi succeeded in scoring his first of many goals for Barcelona. <laughs> Barcelona won their first league title in five years, as Messi played only 70 minutes overall in La Liga and also got his debut in the Champions League and played 90 minutes against Ukrainian side Shakhtar Donetsk. In the summer of 2005, Messi competed with the Argentine national team in the Under-20 World Cup. Despite the many attempts of the Spanish Federation in tying Lionel to the Spanish national team, there was no doubt about his loyalty to Argentina. 
The world was amazed by Messi's performance in the tournament as he scored six goals in total and two goals in the final against the Nigerian national team. Lionel was named player of the tournament after Argentina won the final. And Nike aired an advertisement that reflected Lionel's rise within the world of football. And its message was simple. Recuerda mi nombre, Leo Messi. The 2005-2006 season looked to be the season where Messi would shine in the European stage, but there were some hiccups on the way. The Argentine national team coach Jose Peckerman wanted to reward Messi for his fantastic performance in the summer with a senior debut against Hungary in a friendly match in August of 2005. But his first appearance with the national team didn't go as planned. A carton rouge for Messi! Oh la la! Ah bon, on l'a pas beaucoup vu à l'heure! Shortly after, the Spanish Football Federation suddenly classified Messi as a foreign non-European player despite him completing the required five seasons in the lower ranks of the club. With Ronaldinho, Marquez and Eto being a fixture in the starting lineup, Barcelona had maxed out on non-European players. What's funny was that Messi was registered in the final squad of the Champions League without any complications with UEFA. Thus came the idea of loaning out Messi by the Barca board, as there were some offers on the table, the most serious one coming from Inter Milan and their president Massimo Moratti. But one match changed all of these plans, which was the Juan Gampar trophy against Italian giants Juventus. With the presence of big stars and under the guidance of legendary manager Fabio Capello, Reichardt thought that this was the golden chance for Messi to demonstrate his talents. Messi was subbed with a minute left as he received a standing ovation from the camp now. Capello was amazed and said after the match, I think I've never seen a jugador with such quality for the age he has. Capello's words were important as it put Messi on the European map because Capello was not the kind of manager that gives compliments easily. And here came the official offer from Moratti. Messi's father Jorge discussed the offer with Laporta and mentioned that Inter were ready to offer three times Lionel's current salary. But Laporta managed to calm him down and told Jorge that Lionel was in the best footballing situation and the style at Barca suits him well and will help him develop in the long run. The issue dragged on for a couple of weeks and Messi was still unable to feature in La Liga. Despite Reichardt still using him in the Champions League, the issue was complicated. But in the end, a solution was drafted. Messi signed a new contract with Barcelona, his fourth in the last 18 months. And finally, in September of 2005, Lionel acquired the Spanish nationality. And after missing six matches in the league, Messi was finally ready to participate. Messi quickly took Julie's place on the right of the trio up front and surprisingly started the Clásico at the Santiago Bernabeu as Barca won by three goals to nil against Madrid. He scored his first Champions League goal against Panathinaikos and scored his first league goal that season against Racing in a way that would be repeated many times in his career. <laughs> And in December, he won the Golden Boy Award, beating Wayne Rooney by a big margin. Digging deeper into the archives of the season, we can notice Messi's talents at only 18 years old. From that age, he had the ability to change his pace quickly, dribble past numerous defenders in seconds, was always direct in his playstyle, and always looked to attack and score. Messi also lacked the full vision to find good passes, he lacked physical strength, and also lacked the quickness in making decisions when receiving the ball, and always looks to dribble a lot at any chance. He was mostly playing on his talents and natural abilities, but it was obvious that he was taking the right steps on the right trajectory. When Barcelona faced Chelsea in the round of 16 of the Champions League, Messi showed his impact on the pitch, seeing as it was a sensitive match between the two sides after numerous close encounters in the previous seasons, the atmosphere inside Stamford Bridge was very tense. From the poor pitch conditions to the aggressiveness of the opponent, all factors pointed to Messi having a poor showing, but the 18-year-old was fantastic and managed to get Del Horno sent off and introduced himself to the English and European fans. I get the feeling that he learns this game a bit more, he'll be unplayable at times. Barcelona drew the second leg, but it came at a cost as Messi had torn his thigh muscles and was out for a few weeks. He came back to training a week before the semi-final first leg in the Champions League 
and was eager to quickly come back, but that eagerness had caused him to injure his thigh muscles again. Following that, Messi was back in training two days before the Champions League final, but Rijkaard and his assistant Tenkat thought that Messi was not ready. That decision was devastating for the Argentine, but the truth was that Lionel failed to understand the limits of his body and watched as Barcelona won the Champions League final from the stands. Initially, Messi refused to celebrate with his teammates, but he eventually came out of that dark place and had some fun with the team. Salvinio mentioned that Messi had told him in the locker room that he could never play in a European final in the next 10 years. That was Messi's mature mindset from that young age. Barcelona won the league and the European double, as Messi played in 25 matches in all competitions and managed to score 8 goals. What's more important than these goals was his impact on the pitch at that young age. After his catastrophic debut with the national team, Messi became a regular within Jose Pickerman's squad that succeeded in qualifying to the World Cup in Germany. Despite his injury and his absence from the Champions League final, Lionel was selected for the final Argentinian squad. From very early on, the president of the Argentine Football Federation, Julio Grondona, saw Messi as the future of the national team. He had just signed with Adidas before the tournament, and there were huge posters of Messi around the biggest cities of the world. That was not to everybody's taste within the squad, as there was a divide between the past and the future, between the old guard and the new blood. Nevertheless, Argentina won their first group match against Ivory Coast unconvincingly, as the manager left Messi on the bench for the whole match. The next encounter saw Messi's debut in the World Cup, as he entered in the last 15 minutes of the second group match against Serbia and Montenegro. A Messi, di Bellissima. È bellissima. Messi managed to assist Crespo and score a goal himself. Messi, il tiro. Rete, rete. As the match concluded, Argentina won by six goals to nil. In the following match, Messi played 70 minutes against the Netherlands, as the goalless draw was enough for Argentina to qualify to the next round. Then Messi entered in the 84th minute against Mexico and showed a taste of his talents in extra time, as the Albi Celeste succeeded in advancing to the next round. Leo's displays within the tournament didn't go unnoticed for Guardiola, was writing articles for El Pace and said about Messi in one of his articles, he reminds me of the true greats. And now comes the controversial match, the quarterfinal against the German national team. Tevez and Crespo started up front while Messi was on the bench. It was a natural selection at that time. After Ayala opened the scoring for Argentina, the host started to push up field in the second half then the Argentine keeper got injured as Pickerman was forced to make a change. He also subbed Ray Kilmi for Cambiasso. But the third and final change was the one that created controversy. In hindsight, everything pointed to Messi coming on to pressure Germany's high line. But Pickerman thought he needed a tall striker that can defend set pieces. For that reason, Julio Cruz was called as Messi removed his shoes on the bench. The Germans succeeded in equalizing and then won on penalties as Pickerman faced harsh criticism after their exit. But his assistant Hugo Tokali defended him and said, if the match were to be repeated, we would do exactly the same. Messi was only a teenager and didn't have enough experience, and it's easy to say that the coaching staff was wrong. But one thing was for sure, as Mascherano said, the debate ended after that World Cup. Leo was an automatic starter after that. Despite the success of last season, there were some internal issues brewing within Barcelona's dressing room. The discipline of the team's leaders like Deco and Ronaldinho started to fade, while on the other hand, Messi was looking to improve and rise within the hierarchy of the team. But he unfortunately fractured his left foot in November and was out of action for over two months. Lionel came back to a team that kept failing in big matches. He came back just in time for the round of 16 Champions League encounter against Liverpool. Reds manager Rafa Benitez decided to play the right-footed Arbeloa as a left-back to cover Messi's diagonal runs through the middle, and the plan was effective, as Messi barely had a stamp on the two legs as Liverpool qualified to the next round at the expense of the Blaugrana. Liverpool have done it! In March, another opportunity arose for Messi to shine in a big match as Barcelona hosted rivals Real Madrid in the Camp Nou, 
At that time, Messi was still not clinical in front of goal and missed many chances. But in that Clásico, it was a different story. Despite the ineffectiveness of Ronaldinho and Eto being subbed at halftime after Oliguer's red card, Messi led the team and scored a hat trick to earn Barcelona a precious draw, a landmark match for the young Argentinian. Samuel Eto said after the match, For me today, Messi is above any other player. He has an extra gear. When we look closer into Messi's minutes within the season, we can notice that he still played as he always does, trying to take on defenders, dribbling, great change of pace. Messi, brilliantly away from Garrido. What was missing that season was some end product because of his deep positioning when receiving passes on the right side of the pitch. Alves again, sticking tight to Messi. Although his physical development was obvious. Well, the hold up Daniel Alves, Lionel Messi. Messi was rewarded with a new contract in March of 2007 and managed to show his great ability in dribbling once again in the Copa del Rey semi-final first leg against Getafe. Fans started to seriously think of an answer to the question can we survive without Ronaldinho? And the answer, as Messi demonstrated, may be yes. But despite the brilliance of the goal, Reichardt advised Messi to not take on defenders all the time. He had to pace himself and make the difference in the final third. And since that goal, defenders around the league started to tightly mark Lionel. But Barcelona were in danger of ending the season without a title after Rijkaard decided to not play Messi in the second leg against Getafe, given that Barca won the first leg by five goals to two. But the Blaugrana suffered a humiliating loss by four goals to nil, which kicked them out of the competition. In the league, Barcelona entered the penultimate match against Espanyol with the La Liga title within their hands. And despite Messi's fantastic performance, which included him scoring two goals, one of which was controversial. You know, absolutely handles this. It cheated. And it succeeded. Barca failed to seal the match after a dramatic draw against their neighbors, which resulted in Madrid clinching the title after their win in the last match. In terms of numbers, this was considered Messi's best season yet, as he managed to score 14 goals in La Liga and 17 goals in 36 matches in all competitions. But in terms of achievements, and apart from the Supercopa, Barcelona ended the season without a title and getting rid of Ronaldinho and Rijkaard was considered. But the board, along with President Laporta, decided to hand them one last chance, despite the Dutch manager losing the dressing room completely. Messi joined the Argentine national team to compete in the 2007 Copa America tournament in the summer. 14 years after their last major title in 1993, Argentina entered this iteration as favorites. There were no doubts that Messi was one of the main key figures of the national squad. And after passing the group stage with ease, Argentina faced Peru in the quarter-final stage. Messi played a great match, either on the right or the left flank. Messi was dribbling past the Peruvian defenders with ease and scored a great goal between the legs of the Peruvian keeper. Messi. Wonderful play. In the semi-final against Mexico, Messi scored the goal of the tournament. It's Messi! Simply magnificent! as Argentina easily won by three goals to nil to advance to the Copa America final. Argentina head coach Coco Baselli praised Messi's goal and said, only geniuses are capable of finishing as Messi did. Argentina faced eternal rivals Brazil in the final. The Brazilians arrived to the tournament without some key players like Ronaldinho and Kaká. It was shaping to be Albi Celeste's title as they won everyone over. But against expectations, Argentina were comprehensively beaten by three goals to nil. Messi was not considered the scapegoat for this failure, as he just turned 20 a few weeks earlier at that time. But most of the blame and criticism was aimed towards Raikilmi's shoulders, who never really recovered from that loss, as his professional career took a very different path.
The 2007-2008 season was the season of second chances for Barcelona. Ronaldinho asked for another year to get back to form, while Rijkaard insisted on stopping the team's downward spiral. The club also signed 30-year-old French superstar Thierry Henry. Ronaldinho, Eto, Messi and Henry all in the same team. But in the end, they failed to play a single minute together on the pitch throughout the whole season, as numerous injuries and other disciplinary issues robbed them of a good season. Frank Reichert failed to change the dynamics of the team, as the club suffered in the opening months, as it became obvious that they can't compete with Madrid, as they suffered a loss in the first Clásico in December, as Madrid created a marginal gap in the standings. Reichert was too nice with the players, and failed to officially hand the keys of the team to Messi, who showed everybody that he was the number one star of the team. The Argentinian was asked to be patient and cause damage on the wings. While Messi was turning from a teenager to a man, his body started to negatively react with these drastic changes. Three separate injuries within the season affected the Argentinian mentally, as these injuries made him miss around two and a half months in total. He was putting too much pressure on his body throughout the season, just like he did when he was a kid. He also came back from injuries way too soon, and his diet was not helping as well. Although when he played, he was no doubt one of the best in the world. This is a genius. Henri, Messi, oh, magical! Although he was still stuck on the wings in most matches, he tried drifting more to the center within games and tried to create from there. Messi, it's a great pass. He started the season exceptionally well, as Messi was scoring and even assisting at a very good rate before his first injury. And that is what he added that season, creating more for his teammates. And after all his performances in 2007, he came in third place behind Ronaldo and Kaká and the Ballon d'Or voting. That season saw the first official encounter between Ronaldo and Messi in the Champions League semi-final stage. Although it was quite an uneventful two legs in terms of goals, the Argentinian had a slight upper hand. In the end, Barcelona lost the second leg against United at Old Trafford. What about that? What about that? Barcelona were also out of the same stage in the Copa del Rey and were way off the top of the La Liga standings and ended the season in third position. On the other hand, Messi had another great season as he scored and assisted 16 goals in 40 matches in all competitions. He added the skill of assisting to his footballing repertoire. The old guard of Deco, Ronaldinho, Eto and Reichardt look to have their days numbered in Barcelona. But despite that, we must not forget Reichardt and Ronaldinho's influence on Messi. They gave the young Argentinian the needed space to learn, develop and grow. As Ronaldinho was beside Messi since he joined the first team, but the Brazilians' issues these past two seasons were affecting the dynamic of the whole team. And people started to really question whether Ronaldinho was considered a bad idol for Messi. It was time he left, and time for Messi to wear the number 10 shirt on his back and lift the team on his shoulders. It was time for a new chapter for Barcelona and Messi together. In came a young Pep Guardiola to take over managerial duties at Barcelona, and with him came some stern changes, as both Ronaldinho and Deco were sold, while Eto was on the transfer list, but the Cameroonian proved himself to the new manager with his professionalism and great form within the friendlies in pre-season. It was the first time Leo had gone through this type of an overhaul within the first team, especially as it included the departures of some of his close teammates. Messi respected Guardiola's history as a player, but there was some skepticism around his non-existent experience as a first-team manager. Pep had to win Leo over, but his attempts in the beginning were tough. Within the preseason, Guardiola found it hard to communicate with Leo. He was already a man of few words, but there was something that was annoying him. It turned out that Messi wanted to compete in the Olympics that summer, but the problem was that it coincided with their third-round qualifier for the Champions League and Pep showed to be a very demanding coach and meticulous with his clear ideas, and needed that time in preseason to build his team, and that meant that Messi was staying with the team. The issue dragged on for a few weeks, when eventually Pep decided that the best thing to do was to let Messi leave, just to make sure he knew that he was at his side. 
Messi joined his Argentinian teammates to participate in the Summer Olympics and managed to get revenge on their rivals Brazil in the semi-finals after winning by three goals to nil. It's there, it's 3-0, and surely now it's game over. As Messi finally got to say goodbye to his big brother for the last time, Messi and his teammates went on to win the gold medal after their tough win against the Nigerian national team in the final. While Messi was gone, Barcelona successfully qualified to the group stages of the Champions League as Messi was back just in time for the beginning of the La Liga season. Pep's start with the team was not good in terms of results. But behind the scenes, the squad was confident in Pep's new methods after participating in several quality training sessions. It was a matter of time before these methods would translate and manifest into positive results on the pitch. Pep demanded discipline from his wingers, as Messi was given freedom to drift inside but also had many defensive duties assigned to him. Messi quickly bought in with the coach's demands as he saw the results of his tactics on the pitch. Pep had also brought with him dietitians to the club in order to improve the output and to prevent injuries. As Messi struggled with injuries the previous two seasons, he hardly got injured within Guardiola's reign. As the Barca youth system teached him how to play within a team, Rijkaard gave him confidence and Guardiola added some order to his life. And all of this resulted in a player with unlimited potential. We all here's Messi running at the Atletico Madrid defense all the way! Messi is just brilliantly round love. Here's Lionel Messi. Oh, wonderful! Absolutely wonderful! During Pep's first season, Messi played most matches on the right wing. But because this new and improved iteration of the Blaugrana liked to press the opponent high up the field to keep possession of the ball, Messi found himself in numerous scoring situations as the Argentinian received the ball in very advanced positions. To Messi and it's in. Messi on the turn, looking for the room, finds the room and finds the corner. Messi managed to score 16 goals in all competitions before January and matched his goal tally of the whole of last season. And when we look closer at Messi's minutes throughout the season, we notice better overall strength to keep possession of the ball in his numerous dazzling runs coming from the right-hand side. Although he took many penalties the previous season, he took some pressure ones that year, like the winner away against Catalan neighbors Espanyol in the dying minutes. You never doubted him, and Barcelona have won the Catalan derby. His finishing went up to a whole new level not only because of his good positioning and new tactics, but because of his various ways of finishing. A right-footed half volley, Brilliantly taken by Messi! A volley under pressure from several defenders, Messi! Wonderful finish! Dribbling while balancing and shooting in one sequence, There's no stopping him when he's in this kind of mood. The whole team clicked and were unstoppable. They had stormed the league, and in the Champions League, they managed to score four goals and a half against Bayern München. Messi scored a brace and assisted another. As Messi came in second position behind Ronaldo and head of Torres in the Ballon d'Or voting. As the Blaugrana reached the semi-final stage of both the Copa del Rey and the Champions League, Barcelona had to go to the Santiago Bernabeu to face Madrid. They were in their best form under the manager Juan de Ramos and just four points away from the league leaders Barcelona. Pep wanted to go there and win and he had a brilliant idea. He sat with Messi and showed him some footage of Madrid's central defender's position. He believed if Messi played centrally up front, he would have a lot of space to attack the defenders because he would drop deep and the defenders would not know what to do, while Henri and Eto would stay on the wings, waiting for the moment to attack behind the defense. And that's how Messi got a taste of the false nine position, as the plan worked perfectly. <laughs> Barcelona won a historic match by six goals to two, as the La Liga title was almost wrapped up, and Messi would not play in that position again until later in the season. The semi-final matchup against Chelsea was very tough, as the English side succeeded in blocking off the spaces from Messi, 
in the infamous second leg, the Blaugrana sealed the tie in the dying minutes after Messi set up Iniesta for a shot. It's Iniesta! As Barcelona qualified to the Champions League final, Messi managed to play his first final with the club since breaking into the team as Barcelona faced Athletic Bilbao in the Copa del Rey final. And after a physical match, Messi managed to score and assist a goal to help Barcelona lift their second title of the season after sealing La Liga. El Barça es campeón de la Copa del Rey. The Champions League final was upon them. This time, Messi would feature unlike the 2006 final in Paris. Lo dije durante toda esta semana. Eh, no pude disfrutar jugando la final de París, por eso toda la oportunidad de hacerlo ahora y creo que the final was also considered a rematch between Ronaldo and Messi, as Sir Alex Ferguson said before the match that without doubt they are the best two at the moment. They've had fantastic seasons. Several English media outlets kept publishing a stat of Messi before the European final, which focused on the Argentines' failure in scoring against English teams, but Lionel was ready to accept the challenge. Pep entered the match with a similar setup as the Bernabeu encounter, as after 10 minutes had passed in the final, there was a switch in the lineup as Messi moved to the center. United were surprised by that switch as Eto managed to score the opener. As Barcelona kept possession of the ball after a tough opening period. And despite playing an average match, Messi managed to break his duck and score against an English side with a header. as he sealed the final and the treble for Barcelona and cemented his bid for the Ballon d'Or. Piquet said after the match, Leo demonstrated that he was the best player in the world. And his numbers that season reinforced that belief, as after scoring in the final, Messi became the top goal scorer in the competition with 9 goals, and scored 23 goals in La Liga and 38 goals overall, while assisting a further 19 in 51 matches in all competitions. All of that at only 21 years of age. There was no debate that this was his best season, yet. Pep said in the beginning of the season, I decided Leo was going to play regularly down the middle. And with that quote, and because Eto didn't fancy playing on the wings, the decision to sell was official. Messi's tactical role was clear for the new season. But how did Zlatan Ibrahimovic end up at Barcelona? Eto refused to go on loan to Valencia and said yes to Inter Milan. Moreover, the technical staff at Barca were fans of the Swedish striker, so the deal was set. Eto left for the Nerazzurri plus 46 million euros and Zlatan came the other way. Guardiola decided to implement the classic Dutch 4-3-3, which usually has a forward capable of holding the ball like Zlatan Ibrahimovic. But for that lineup to work, Zlatan had to establish an understanding with his colleagues on the pitch, especially with Leo, who liked to come from the right and occupy those central areas. But unlike Eto, who pushed defenders deep into the box, Zlatan liked to receive the ball outside the penalty area. It was destined to be a tricky season given this predicament. But there were no such issues in the beginning, as Barcelona started the season strongly, as both Zlatan and Messi were scoring goals and helping the team win matches. With the UEFA Super Cup and the Supercopa España in the bag, they had one title left to complete the sextuple, and that was the Club World Cup in December. In the final against Estudiantes, Messi scored with his chest an extra time to secure the sixth title for Barca. After he came in third position in 2007 and second position in 2008, Messi won the Ballon d'Or in 2009 and also won the FIFA Player of the Year award, which was exclusively voted by international managers and national team captains from around the globe. Despite the individual accolades, Barcelona started the new year with a couple of blips as they crashed out of the round of 16 of the Copa del Rey against Sevilla in January. And despite the positive results in the league, Guardiola studied Messi's performances closely, especially when he failed to score and impact the game in three consecutive matches within the month of February. The third match of the series was the round of 16 encounter against Stuttgart, which saw Barca draw 1-1 in Germany. 
Pep noticed Messi's preoccupation with defensive duties against an attacking fullback from the German team and had little impact from the wings as well. And when he decides to cut inside, Barcelona would pay the price defensively. For that reason, Guardiola decided to play Messi in the false nine position in the return leg with Pedro and Henri beside him as Barcelona won by four goals to nil with Messi scoring a brace. For years, Messi was waiting to be played in this position consistently. Circumstances pushed Pep to take the decision despite Zlatan's presence. The Swedish striker didn't do anything wrong. He was on a great scoring run and was still starting most matches in the league. But despite his effectiveness on an individual level, he was still not the best option for Barcelona. An example of this complicated matter was the quarter-final matchup against Arsenal. Zlatan started the first leg at the Emirates Stadium, and despite him not clicking with his teammates, the Swede managed to score a brace as Barca left London with a thrilling draw. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, 2-0! Pep resorted to a secret weapon and played Messi in the middle again and what happened will be cemented in the history books. With Guardiola's tweaks throughout the year, Messi managed to score a hat-trick in three separate occasions before he scored four goals in the second leg against the Gunners. It was clearly the right fit for the whole team, especially when they play in the tricky European matches. But Guardiola suddenly went against his intuition when they visited the Giuseppe Miazza to face Inter Milan under the manager Jose Mourinho, as he played Zlatan in the middle and Messi on the wings. Mourinho completely outcoached Pep in both legs as Barca's weapons were nullified. Milito, tre, uno, Pep stick to the same formation in the return leg, but after only 60 minutes, Zlatan was subbed to push Messi to the middle, but it was not enough. An outstanding defensive display from Inter saw them go through, despite Mota's red card. Milito, finale. The Zlatan-Messi dynamic can be summarized like this. Zlatan is not the type of player to go against his natural playstyle, and in his mind, he was not bought to make space for Leo. As Zlatan said, it is like you bought a Ferrari, but you are driving it as if it were a Fiat. Zlatan tried to discuss the issue with Pep, but the situation was clear. There were no issues on a personal level between Messi and Zlatan. On the other hand, Leo never asked Zlatan to leave. As former Barca director of football Chiki Biggerstein had mentioned, Zlatan's style of play simply made Pep and Barcelona take a decision. In the end, it was a footballing problem and its victim was Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Barcelona ended the season with a league title that saw them pick up 99 points, while Messi scored 34 goals in La Liga, a feat not achieved since Ronaldo in 1997. Messi scored 47 goals overall and assisted a further 12 in 53 matches in all competitions. Each year was considered Messi's best season yet. His ascendancy was unstoppable despite the tactical issues with the team. By that time, Messi's international career with Argentina was considered somewhat successful. An under-20 World Cup champion in 2005 and a gold medalist in the 2008 Olympics. Despite the disappointments of the 06 World Cup and the 07 Copa America, Messi wasn't considered the main protagonist of the team or the man that would bear all the blame. But with the arrival of the 2010 World Cup and with his numerous achievements both on an individual and team level with Barcelona, there was no doubt that he was the number one star of Argentina. In the middle of the World Cup qualifying campaign, the Argentine national team suffered under coach Coco Baselli. Diego Maradona singled out Messi as the sole reason for the poor performances. Diego slowly created a general mistrust of Messi in the minds of the average Argentina fan who worshipped Maradona. After the 1-1 draw against the Peruvian national team in September of 2008, Maradona said, sometimes Messi plays for Messi. He has so much arrogance that he forgets about his teammates. Pressure was absolutely mounting on Messi as he replied to Maradona's critique and said, I'm used to Diego speaking out. We all know what he is like. But Maradona didn't stop talking. And as the national team kept suffering under coach Coco Baselli, 
The Federation thought that the best way to shut Maradona up was to put him in the hot seat and coach Argentina. So in October of 2008, Maradona was appointed Albi Celeste manager. With no coaching badge and a total of three victories within two stints as a manager in the 90s, Maradona found himself coaching one of the best talents in the 21st century. Diego wanted to replicate what Guardiola did at Barcelona to get the best out of Messi, but it was more complicated than only playing the same system. It demanded different personnel and drills and also better training sessions, all of which were far beyond Maradona's capabilities as a manager. But Maradona and Leo got pretty close in that period, as Diego understood Messi's ambitions and his quiet demeanor, and gave him the legendary number 10 shirt. And that was possible after Ray Kilmi's second retirement, after he and Maradona got into a rift. But results kept being inconsistent. A 4 0 win against Venezuela, which saw Maradona praise Leo, was followed by a humiliating 6 1 loss against continent minnows Bolivia. El sexto. El sexto. Maradona failed to prepare the team to execute within matches, while Messi was not at his best as he searched for individual brilliance in a team that lacked cohesion. In six matches under Maradona, Argentina won in two and lost four, but with two matches left in the qualifiers, it was still within their hands, as they managed to win against Peru and Uruguay and qualify to the World Cup by the skin of their teeth. As the 2010 World Cup edged closer, Maradona sat with Messi to decide on the best system to get the most out of Leo. Messi suggested two systems and discussed other details as well. And suddenly, Messi felt positive about their chances. But in Argentina at that time, there was a feeling that Leo was like a stranger in the national team. He was a superstar at Barcelona and a shadow of his usual self with Argentina. Some perceive him as not Argentinian because of his development in a foreign country, and others see him as uninterested in the national team. Nevertheless, Messi and his teammates started their World Cup campaign in very good form, as they won all of their opening three matches convincingly. Messi was even handed the captaincy in the third group match against Greece, as Mascherano was absent, a move from Maradona to keep the morale very high. Messi said, in the national team, I was not the same. I was not who I was at Barcelona, but I've always had Diego's support. And I changed all of that thanks to my teammates' confidence in me. Despite their 3-1 win against Mexico in the round of 16, none of the players were convinced of Maradona's system, which saw four attack-minded players play in front of Messi, with Mascherano behind him as the pivot. They needed to improve immensely in their quarter-final matchup against the Germans. But in their first big match of the tournament, Argentina collapsed and gave up four goals to a clinical German side. It's four! Messi scored 47 goals with Barcelona that season and ended up without a single goal in five matches at the World Cup. Messi off the frame! Under the manager Maradona, Messi had only three goals in 16 matches, one of his worst stretches ever with the Argentine national team. And despite the tactical, managerial, and individual issues within the team, the criticism back home focused on one person, and that was Messi. Because he failed to lift an average team by himself to win the World Cup. And why not? Maradona had done it in the past. These were their views. Why doesn't he celebrate with enough passion? If he was earning Euros, he would have played better. He is arrogant. He is autistic. These were the things that were said and written about Messi, in Argentina. And Messi had never seen a backlash like this in his young career to this point. And the question now was how can he come back from these recent disappointments? Are we sure that he's destined to be one of the best in history? Or were these last few years only a blip? Only the future holds the rest of the story. The story of how Messi ruled Europe and then the world. <laughs>